we have uh, full capacity here today and we're coming from our own home. So just bear with us in case there's any connectivity issues, which clearly there might be. Um, so I'm Caroline and I'm the membership manager here with, um, with DMI. And uh, Cahill, who is the founder and owner of Digital Basics, is joining us to talk about setting up your own e-commerce business. Um, just in terms of a few housekeeping, um, we have hundreds of people on today. We're, we're at full capacity. We've nearly 1900 register for this webinar and it's from an audience that is global. So please tell us who you are and where you're from and uh, we'll make sure to give you a shout out. Now we have a number of people who are attending here today who, um, are our certified CPD members. So just for you guys, at the end of this webinar, we're going to be sending you out a certificate of attendance. But also today we're going to be automating your CPD credit. So there's no need to um, upload the certificate as proof of your CPD or your attendance. If you haven't seen your CPD credits be applied within the next 48 hours, then please do follow up with us and maybe pop that certificate of attendance up there. But in the main, um, everybody should have their credits applied automatically. Um, then uh, at the end of the session, um, we're going to have a hopefully very interactive Q&A session with Cahill. And uh, so please don't hold those questions off to the very end. Keep them coming in and that way we'll address them all um, as soon as we're, we've reached that time period. So we're going to have about 45 minutes of um presentation before we move into that Q&A. So I'm looking forward to joining you all back then. Um, right now, I'm going to sign off and uh, let Cahill take the wheels and, uh, or sorry, the wheel, I should say. Um, and I'll be back in about 45 minutes. So thank you everyone for, um, for coming on to the webinar today. So this is meant to be very practical in the sense that like, we're going to break down some pretty complicated areas of e-commerce and some overlooked areas of e-commerce to help you set up an e-commerce business, to help you work with your clients, to set up an e-commerce business, or indeed to just guide people in existing e-commerce businesses to how to do it better. Um, so I'm just gonna begin by sharing my screen and that will bring us over to the presentation. So um, yeah, there you go. So um, to begin, we are going to look at our agenda here and our agenda is pretty straightforward. Now, this is important. And there's just four points in this, um, in this webinar. The first point is absolutely essential. It's the planning area. So we're going to look at considerations and pitfalls of moving to e-commerce. So that's for people who are going to try it out and equally retailers who want to move into the e-commerce space. From there, we're going to move on to um, choosing the model that's right for you. So whether it's going to be drop shipping, or whether you're a manufacturer who produces the goods yourself and different things like that. Um, we're gonna then start digging deep into uncovering opportunities. So this is about establishing your market and understanding is there a market there in the first place and, um, and how can you capitalize on that. Once you've planned and you understand the value of everything that's going on, uh, we're gonna start moving to the setup piece that will be kind of choosing your platform, uh, setting up the shop, looking at the different options available. Then from there, once we have our site set up and um, everything loaded in, we look at the operational side of e-commerce in terms of delivery, packaging, logistics, you know, warehousing, all of that stuff. And um, when we have our operations kind of sorted, then we can get into the glory area of our marketing because I know loads of people just want to talk about e-commerce marketing, but the fact is that without good planning, setup, and operations, there is no e-commerce. Um, no amount of marketing is essentially going to do it. So, but we'll assume that we'll have implemented the three previous steps effectively, and we will go on to the marketing piece, which we've split into three areas. We've got the building the brand, which is obviously where you set up and you start off and you start kind of telling people about your values and what that means, and ultimately influencing them to why they should buy from you. You know, the channels they use in terms of social media, PR, um, and content marketing. From there, we'll start digging into the sales piece because it is e-commerce. Um, so we'll be looking at our channels like pay-per-click, we'll look at affiliates, 
we'll look at search engine optimization, talk a little bit about media budget strategy and analytics. So when we're kind of up and running with our new customer acquisition piece, we'll then finish up with retaining customers using things like email coupons, retargeting and loyalty programs. So let's kick off without further ado into our um, presentation on how to set up an e-commerce company. Okay, so first of all, our considerations for um, our considerations for e-commerce. So uh, the questions I guess we need to ask ourselves are, um, are you a business that sells exclusively to online channels? Um, so have you, got the, have you got the infrastructure in place to actually make this transition smoothly? You know, um, have you got the brand credibility and an existing customer base to build on? And are you able to combine an online and offline presence? You know, because this is extremely valuable um, in certain industries, just to, le just to leverage the kind of connectivity of your customers. Um, there's also things like click and collect, which as you know, are a, um, are a growing channel for sales within the e-commerce world. But ultimately, what we have to ask ourselves are, um, if, if we're a business that sells exclusively to online channels, um, we'll have the infrastructure in place and we can make this transition because there's been loads of cases where high street brands, where brands that are bricks and mortar kind of set up, but they, they underestimate the amount of effort that goes into setting up all of the different elements of e-commerce. It's not just throwing up a website, putting up PayPal and starting to sell. You know, we do need a whole load of kind of infrastructural considerations around how do we buy our product for e-commerce? Where do we store our product? You know, what is the content that we need to create for our product to uh, encourage people to buy it? And then when it comes to actually popping it in the mail or with couriers, do we have those logistical pieces set up? The reason I'm trying to emphasize this is if you have a bricks and mortar thing, you may not have like warehousing or storage functionality beyond your current needs of your bricks and mortar outlet. However, with e-commerce, the, the, the potential is limitless. So you will need a far greater or far more kind of efficiently managed stock management system in order to deal with the amount of um, uh, transactions, hopefully, that you will get through being a successful e-commerce company. But so that's kind of our first consideration. Now, the second consideration, which I've mentioned already is, well, are we a brand and can I build on this? You know, like leverage what you've already done. Don't exactly reinvent the wheel here. And then if you do have a bricks and mortar outlet, so you do have a physical store, certainly try and combine your e-commerce element with the, with the um, built infrastructure of your store. The reason I say this is people do, um, as I said, click and collect and stuff like that, but also people do use stores as showrooms and then they may go ahead and order online at a time when they see fit at the end of the month when they got paid, when they got a bonus, whatever it is. But ultimately, because e-commerce stores are 24 seven, we still need to use any kind of existence of, um, of bricks and mortar or physical stores if we have them. Now look, if we don't have them, it doesn't matter. But just these are some considerations for people who have those outlets and are thinking of moving across to the end. Um, to the e-commerce offering. It's not just a straight jump. There's a lot of things we have to consider, um, including these. So when we look at some common pitfalls, um, when we, uh, common pitfall, pitfalls of moving to e-commerce, um, we obviously have, you know, to approach it with our existing resources. Now, what I mean by this is businesses might not understand, they might have to be limited in the type of e-commerce proposition that they can use. What I mean by that is you might be a very successful pet store, but you're not going to be able to sell certain types of your products um, online, like, like birds or something like that. And um, equally, you may have a very successful um, like, like art offering or, or you may be a very successful consultant, but you may not be able to bring that online. So your business type has to be suited to the e-commerce model. Not everything that you can buy in you know, the traditional world is essentially consumed online. So um, it's important to understand, do you, have the, um, do you have the kind of scope 
as a business, as an industry, to move over to e-commerce. You know, and um, the other thing that's really important is business models. And we'll pause on business models for a moment. Uh, I'll detail them further in the next slide. But ultimately, business models um, are very different in the e-commerce world than they are in the uh, in the traditional commerce world, traditional retail world. So within e-commerce, um, we have a number, like loads of different business models. We have drop shipping, which we know where we just take other people's stock and sell it on their behalf. We're kind of like an affiliate. Um, we do have, we can be familiar, we can be a, um, a producer, so someone who makes the product. We can be someone that just buys in product but stores it. And um, we can equally be a, um, a software or tech e-commerce company. So you might find companies the likes of uh, for, of, Adobe, of Adobe or indeed um, or, or Microsoft, who you can buy their software and download their software, but you're buying it in an e-commerce model. You know, so these are the type of different models we have available. Not every kind of model is suitable to existing and pre-existing businesses. So we have to understand um, is the right, or et cetera, I have to understand what is the models available and what is the model that is most suited to my business if I want to sell online. Um, the last point, equally, I want to pause on for a moment. Um, and that is simply the lack of insight into the capital investment required Many organizations believe that I have a store, I can just crack open an old Shopify and start selling online. But it is absolutely not as simple as that. Yes, there are efficiencies in e-commerce, but ultimately there is still a significant amount of capital investment to get an e-commerce, uh, a proper e-commerce offering up and running from signing up with different content creators for your website, developers for your website, and logistical partners, um, you do have payment gateways. There's all these kind of, um, I suppose, understandings we have to have. You may have legal requirements now that you never had before if you're shipping internationally. There's a lot of stuff involved with e-commerce. It's all good stuff. But ultimately, the key takeaway from this point is you can't just crack open an e-commerce store and expect to start selling. There is a significant amount of capital investment in order to, um, in order to drive e-commerce forward. And it's worth it because the efficiencies that e-commerce bring are immense, but it's not free. It's not free for the, the, re the retailer or the e-tailer. Um, so I would like to very much emphasize and underscore the importance of capital investment when you're setting it up. It may require some project management. You may need to know all the different elements. We'll cover a lot of them here, but it may be something different, specific to your own industry that you may have to consider as well. But anyway, if we can take the two key points here from, from this slide, that is, we need to get familiar with business models um, and the most applicable business model for e-commerce and then uh, to our current offering, and then understand that it is not free, that there is a capital investment. And we do need to invest strategically in certain areas like creative, like content, like web development, like media channels like logistics and all of that stuff and it's not necessarily that cheap until the efficiencies come in when you're up and running then you start noticing and um, the real value of e-commerce so um so there are just some pitfalls i wanted to call out at this stage um when it comes to e-commerce planning we always have to ask ourselves what is our objective of starting an e-commerce store you know what is my objective and we can generally boil it down to kind of two two main kind of areas. If I'm a manufacturer of goods, um, meaning I make my product or I, you, you know, I, I, I ultimately create the product that, um, that I'm selling. You know, um, the, the pros of this are obviously I have high ownership of the product, I have more emotional investment um, in starting an e-commerce company because it's my passion. It's my passion to sell my products online. Um, I can have higher margins, obviously, because I make the product itself, um, and uh, when my production and supply chain is optimized, I can increase those margins a little bit further. And the difficulty is I own the stock. Now here's where we have to start really considering stuff. Stock and stock ownership equals risk. I've invested money in this stock. So because I own the stock, I own the risk, you know, and I need to source production materials and have storage space, which are subject to changes in market dynamics, 
yeah. and there's all kinds of cash investment involved in all of this. So we do need to kind of plan for owning and housing our stock if we are a manufacturer. Now, the only caveat on this is if you're a software developer, it's only um, space on a hard drive, so it doesn't necessarily apply um, if you're into software e-commerce. But if you're into actual physical e-commerce, selling your own goods that you've created or produced um, using e-commerce, uh, there is risk with holding on to stock, especially if you can't shift it. You have to have the space and you have to have, I suppose, the supply chain being optimized. And indeed, you're just, you're holding it there. And if you're not selling it, it's depreciating and it's ultimately a cost on the business. So you do need to plan for that effectively. When it comes to drop shipping, which is essentially, it's a minimal risk outlet. You know, you're, you're, not, you're not actually owning any stock. You're just kind of buying, and buying stock off a manufacturer and then shipping it off to whoever wants to buy it. So you're a third party. You're, you never, ever, ever, you may never even see the stock. You may never even see the products that you sell. Um, the difficulty is that you are at the absolute mercy of your suppliers. So you're selling other people's products on their behalf. You buy off a wholesaler and you shift it, shift it off to, your, to, your, to whoever's buying it off you. If the wholesaler changes their prices, if they do, do anything that disrupts your margin, you're at their behest. And then your whole, your whole kind of uh, revenue strategy is out the window. So while it's minimal risk, there's um, in terms of stock, there's a bit more risk in terms of margin. So there's uh, minimal risk in terms of margin generally when, up, when supply chains are optimized well for manufacturers, but there's more risk with holding on to stock. Drop, drop shippers is literally, okay, I'll buy off the retailer and ship it directly to them. Um, and I won't even see it, I'm just a third party. So you might want to think to yourself, if you're thinking about setting up an e-commerce, is it because I'm making it or is it because I want to sell stuff for other people? Now, you need to understand the risk, risks and benefits of that, and that's outlined in detail on this slide itself. Um, when it comes to uh, e-commerce planning, this is absolutely essential. And I want people not to be hurt by this uh, when I say it that when you make your product and you love your product, you need to realize that not everyone loves your stuff or will love your stuff or wants your stuff. So even though you think that there is a market for your particular niche or product or something like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a market. It just means you like it. So first thing we need to do is control our bias when it comes to how we assess the value of our own products, you know? Um, so we need to understand, is there actually a market here for my stuff or am I fooling myself? And it's just, um, I'm an enthusiastic amateur or I am uh, on a, uh, a flight, flight of fancy. Um, when we've established that, yes, there is a, we believe there is a potential market here, um, we need to start looking at how do our customers buy, and um, we need to assess the size of that market because there might be a market, but it might be very small, it might be very hard to reach. You know, so we need to understand how effectively and efficiently can we get to that market that we believe we can make money off. You know, because if it's too small, it's not worth it. Um, so how we might go about doing this? So obviously, we do some desk research. So just Google it. Start looking at the industry. Look at searches about your product, your audiences, and your market. Just, just use Google as your resource there. Try to identify with a competitive landscape, are there other people in the industry doing this stuff? How do they do it? And, and how are you going to do it differently? So understand their product offering, their price range, and their tone. So how they communicate on social media, um, email, subscribe to all their stuff. Um, look what markets they operate in and try and identify how they engage with their audience. All of this will allow you to plan. All of this will allow you understand the value of the market and keep you motivated because it can get very it can you know really really drain your energy setting from an e-commerce company and you do need wins so to keep yourself motivated and keep yourself going towards that final prize of effectively setting up an e-commerce organization we need to understand and um, we only need to understand the value of the market and how we can fit in and how we can offer a better offering than our competitors keep herself motivated. 
Um, likewise, we might want to look at industry trends. So is the market gone up or down? Is it in decline? Is it contracting? Is it expanding? You know, are there new players? Can you establish yourself as a new player? What's the barriers to entry look like? Things like this, you know, um, what do you need to enter that market? Do you need special kind of legal guidelines? Do you need um, any kind of licenses? Do you need an existing audience? What exactly it is, is it? Understand the industry itself. And then just to help you kind of follow the kind of real time movements of market activity, set up social listening and alerts. What I mean by that is try and find out what people are saying about your brand. Try and find out what people are saying about your competitors. Try and find out what people are saying about your products in your industry. You can use a tool, and um, hopefully everyone does or will use it after this called Google Alerts. It's a free tool. So just do a Google search for Google Alerts and it will say, um, okay, we will send you an email when any of these keywords appear. So the keywords you should enter will be um, your brand name, your competitor's brand name, your product category. So whenever any news emerges that contain your competitors, you get information, you get that email. Whenever any news um, emerges with uh, mentioning your brand name, your product, you get an email. So set up Google Alerts to allow you to understand what's going on in the industry and, um, and to understand the kind of real-time movements of the market. So we kind of, we have a good establishment of a good, good kind of view of the market at this point. So now let's look at some setup here and our setup options. We've decided, yes, there is a market, there is value, this is worth my time, and I'm gonna jump. Okay, now take time in that planning section because uh, the, more, the more time you put in your planning, the more uh, effective all of the, uh, the next steps will be. So now let's take a look at setup. Um, so these are broadly kind of the elements of a, um, of an e-commerce site. Okay, so we have our homepage, which we know, our category pages, which are kind of like, say we're a, say we're a jewelry website, we'll have a rings category, we'll have a bracelets category, category. And each in each of those categories, they contain the individual products, the individual rings, the individual bracelets, the individual jewelry items. So we've got category category pages, which kind of are the catch-all for certain types or groups of products and then collection pages is also is, is another name for it but you also might if you're a jewelry for example you might name a collection so if you're tiffany or if you're cartier you might name a certain collection or if you're a large electronics retailer you might have brand names in there or something like that but this is how you kind of structure how people move to your site we've got product pages which is where you have your product we've got our cart and our checkout, let's pause here. Your cart and your checkout are similar, but different, okay? You can add an item to your cart. That just means that an item has been added to your cart. When you look in your cart, there's a button that says proceed to checkout. The checkout is a different part of your website than the cart, okay? The cart is in the main website. The checkout is a separate part of the website that is purely associated with enter your details enter your credit card enter your shipping um, and go ahead and purchase you know so your cart is kind of the starting point and then your checkout is a separate area so we generally like to send anyone who abandons their checkout so they've added an item to the cart and they've started the checkout process and they've entered their email on the first page then we're able to send them abandon an email saying, oh, we saw you didn't complete your purchase. Do you want to go ahead and complete that? If someone adds something to the cart and you don't know who they are, you know, they're not logged in or something, you can't send them an abandonment email. So the checkout and the cart are similar, but different. And I did want to draw that distinction. And um, we also have our navigation, we have our site search, we have our filters. All are important. All allow users to um, browse your products, See what they like, arrange it by prices, by color, by style, whatever it is. And then finally, we have our customer accounts, which you should generally make optional. Um, you don't. You, you should allow people to, to buy off you without creating an account. The reason I say this is it's stressful to create an account for a customer. And, um, and uh, generally, 
we don't want to add any friction, which is reasons that may, are things that make it difficult for me to buy. You know, we don't want to introduce any friction into the purchase process. So always make your customer accounts optional. Um, so now let's take a look at a couple of platforms. So I'm going to begin with Shopify and just qu very quickly and easily um, run through these notes here. So it is a very quick and easy setup. You can start at the basic package of like $29 a month. You have no tech worries. It's secure. It is reliable. There's a lot of community support. And there is customer service, even at that $29 price point. Um, it is customizable, but it is pre-built as well. So we do have pre-built teams, which we can chop and change to our own liking. We can add things like apps or additional functionality. There's good SEO. There is good SEO on Shopify. We do have that abandoned checkout recovery automatically built into, into Shopify. So once someone enters the checkout and they and they put their email address in as the in the first um in the first field, and if they any time they abandon after that, we can send them an email. Um, and the other thing with Shopify it integrates with loads of payment gateways. So we can you can get paid through PayPal, you can get paid through um you can get paid through uh, Stripe, you can get paid through all kinds of different um, uh, payment providers. And it just it just links, it works beautifully. It's a very good platform for anyone who's looking to set up an e-commerce offering fairly quickly. Um, it's generally suitable for small to medium size organizations. Um, the prices really go up when you start getting into the, the larger enterprise level stuff, but we'll talk about enterprise level e-commerce in a moment. Um, another option might be something like WooCommerce. So WooCommerce is WordPress's, um, WordPress's uh, offering. So it's free, it's open source, it's customizable, um, it's fairly easy to use. It's mobile optimized, just like Shopify, good SEO features and good WordPress community support. It's really good for content marketing simply because WordPress is so good content marketing and blogs and SEO and all of that stuff. And like Shopify, it does an integrated payment gateways. So there are there are parts you have to pay for. There's additional kind of widgets and there's and there's plugins and stuff that are paid, but predominantly WooCommerce is free. You do need to have a ideally you'd want a WordPress website with a with a WooCommerce plugin to manage your e-commerce. With Shopify, it's all one unit but you do have that monthly fee. Then we might have something like Wix. So Wix is it's, it's suitable for beginners. It's got limited stock trading functionality, uh, tracking functionality. Um, it's relatively inexpensive between 17 and $25 a month. And um, the website's much easier to build than the other guys. You can kind of drag and drop stuff around the place and you can add different widgets and features as you see fit. There's loads of design templates to choose from and it does integrate with a bunch of gateways but it's kind of beginner level and sometimes can be a little bit slow um, to load. So there's a couple of drawbacks there depending on the amount of um, the amount of widgets and functionality you built in. Uh, but it is one certainly for anyone who's kind of thinking of beginning it because you can just drag and drop your website, your web page together, pull this element here, put that there, picture over here. It's fairly straightforward to use. And then we have something like Squarespace, which is just, for design is really good. You can design really nice websites with drag and drop functionality. Um, E-commerce a little bit more expensive, uh, 24 to 36 uh, euros a month. I didn't get the dollar value, I got the euro value. But um, there is SEO functionality, good customer support, integrates with payment gateways. And but things like abandoned checkouts, you have to pay more for them. So Squarespace is a kind of more expensive um, uh, entry level option essentially. So we've got Shopify, WooCommerce, Wix, and Squarespace as our entry level options, um, and they have different price points uh, and different functionality depending on what you want. But they're all relatively easy to do it, and you don't need to be a coder to do any of this stuff. However, Magento is a enterprise level um, uh, e commerce offering. It is code heavy. It allows you to do massive amount of uh, kind of integrations with warehouses, with functionality, with stock tracking, with taxes, with delivery, with a lot of stuff. 
it's really only suitable for large, larger e-commerce sellers. You know, significant, high-level, mid-level to enterprise-level um, e-commerce organizations. You know, you'd want to be doing 50, 60 grand minimum a month, probably to be selling on um, selling on a uh, Magento. You can sell internationally easier on it than the other ones, but you're probably not going to be selling. Like, I mean, what I mean by internationally is you can have different language stores with different language setups with different prices and all that stuff. Um, it does require secure hosting, which is an additional cost. Uh, you can get design templates, but customizing them requires a Magento developer. It can be expensive. Um, there's advanced inventory um, integrations. It works with most gateways, and you can, as I said, you can set up different storefronts. But from the majority of people, Magento is probably just a little bit out of reach. Um, so when it comes to operations, now that we've set up, planned our stuff, established our market, set up our website, let's look at actually getting the gig going. Um, uh, let's look at warehousing. So we've got our kind of three options here. We've got our self-managed warehouse. We've got our outsourced warehouse or drop shipping. So we've got different control levels. If we are a manufacturer of our own stuff, we may uh, store it ourselves, but that can uh, help stretch our resource capabilities. If we outsource it, if we may surrender some control, also you have to pay someone, but you can utilize the expertise of the outsource uh, firm. But if you're drop shipping, you don't have any inventory and you've no requirement to handle stock. So depending on your business model and what you're hoping to achieve, you have uh, these three warehousing options. It is important to consider, where are you going to keep the stuff you're selling? You know, you might keep in your bedroom, by the way, that's, and that's also fine. I don't have bedroom down here, but, um, but it certainly is a, certainly is a, <laughs> a warehouse type. Um, now let's talk about packaging, because people get the, the item in the post, and it's really important. So I'm keen to emphasize the creative importance and the brand value of, um, of packaging. So it does reinforce your brand perception. Um, the, delivery of, the delivery of the product is one of the last touch points of the customer's journey. So make sure that there's something kind of special about it. You know, put a note in the box and make sure the packaging looks like, put a ribbon on it. Um, if you can instruct your delivery person to say something, whatever it may be, but make it, make it something interesting. Make it a differentiator for you. Um, encourage people to do unboxing of your items to make some UGC content. We'll talk about that in the next section, which is um, which is uh, uh, the marketing section, but unboxing and all that stuff is important. And well-designed creative packaging is really likely to leave a long lasting impression with the customer because they're like, I liked how that arrived. I loved when I saw my first iPhone arriving. I loved you know, the way the box felt and all of that. Um, boxing and packaging is absolutely essential. So don't try not to just lob it in a box and put some masking tape around it you know um certainly consider the packaging and the feelings that that can evoke with customers who receive this and then will hopefully go ahead and then uh, purchase from you again because as i said it does increase the likelihood of repeat purchases and it's much easier to get um, a purchase from an existing customer than to try and uh, get a new customer to buy so anything you can do to keep existing customers happy satisfied and delighted certainly do it and packaging is one of those ways so i did want to take a note of the unwrapping experience so and what i mean by that is make sure it's not hard to open be like oh i can't open it why can't i open this that's really frustrating make sure that it's easy and hassle-free to open you know um and then if you can obviously include other promotions any kind of material related products to cross sell on the packaging and on the on the delivery material itself. It's a good option just to get in front of your audience. Um, so we have a website, we have a warehouse, we have a package. Um, now let's talk about purchasing. So uh, the role of purchasing is really important. So what I mean by purchasing is buy, if you're a manufacturer is buying the stuff in your, um, uh, that makes your product. So we need to we really need to kind of source correct supply chains. We need to understand that there are other people looking for these raw materials that make our product, or these other drop shippers that want to buy, want to ship these items. So we need to bid effectively. We need to manage our suppliers. 
who who manages our stuff and have good relationships with them you know and we do need to control costs because buying the stock uh, or the elements that you're going to use to create your stock is a costly exercise so we do need to control that and there are legal controls over ownership invoicing over returns over um, delays in delivery over all of these different things so we do need to understand the different roles and um, that the purchasing function kind of uh, has to kind of deal with. So we do need to buy things to sell things. And these are the five or six elements that I would um, I'd certainly recommend we keep an eye on when we're doing our buying and managing our supply chain effectively. So we've made a product, we have a website, we have a market, we've all this stuff. Now we're going to deliver it out. So we've got a couple of different options here for what's called our last mile logistics. Um, we've got super fast carriers like airlines, they can be expensive. We've got inexpensive carriers like ships, but you know, just be careful about how the product is handled. We've got signature acquired suppliers or uh, delivery, uh, uh, delivery organizations uh, like Postage or UPS and all that stuff. And there's also pickup points. So it might be important to consider what exactly, what exactly is the best delivery option that um, matches your value proposition and delivers customer satisfaction and allows you still to retain some margin. So if you really value the offering that you give, you might want to use a more expensive delivery type. And um, if you want to really increase customer satisfaction, again, something bespoke or something timely. And then, uh, but then again, you always have to consider costs. So just some just some considerations around managing the logistical side of things. It's a lot more complicated than just opening a website and trying to sell. We do have to think about all of these different elements. So um, we do also have to think about seasonality. So um, do we need additional staff at Christmas? Do we need uh, to buy additional stock um, when it comes to logistics? And when it comes to kind of uh, different things like weather, affecting travel routes and uh, lockdowns. Uh, how are we going to get our stock to people? So how can we go ahead and do this? We need to plan for the fact that things are going to get in the way and we need to have contingency in place for staff, for carriers, for events and for, um, for different things like that that just may, may just kind of uh, destroy our entire supply chain uh, from our, our, char, our entire last mile and um, last mile logistics so um so that's kind of the operation side of things it's a lot to do you know it's, as i said it's not just necessarily setting up the site and um and starting to sell we've, we've a good many things to think about. but we've done all that and we're delighted and we're going to promote it so let's talk about that we start with building the brand we build the brand using channels like social media using pr and content so engage your customers with top of, at the top of the funnel Make them aware that you exist. Talk about your values, your brand proposition, your offering, what you stand for. Ask customers for feedback. Show why you're valuable. You know, educate your customers in terms of why they should choose you and why you are the best organization for them to buy whatever it is that, they're, that you sell. We do need to measure this because we can, marketing is a black hole of, um, of media spend. So, what are the kind of different metrics we might measure um, in relation to our brand building exercise? So we might look at um, how reach and frequency, which is basically how many people saw our content, our ads, our activity, and frequency is how often did they see it, okay? We want to look at things like how is our engaged audience growing? You know, are we seeing repeat visitors to our website? Are we seeing longer time on site from repeat visitors? Are we seeing repeat purchases? from repeat visitors. Um, the last point is something I really want to emphasize here. So there's generally a finite number of people who look for your brand online, okay? It doesn't really change. There's probably about a thousand people say, we're looking for your brand online. Until you do a big display campaign, until you do a big Facebook campaign, TV campaign, a big announcement, a big PR campaign, something like that, then suddenly more people know about you and then suddenly more people start searching for you. So always keep an eye on your brand searches. If your brand search goes up, it means that more people are becoming aware of your product and um, what you're talking about. So when it comes to driving sales, um, now that people are aware of our stuff, um, 
we'll look at channels like paid search. When people search, they will find us. Affiliates are people who will kind of coerce, will kind of, I suppose, funnel people into our buying cycle. And if if uh, if they buy, um, we give them a portion of the commission. We can also use SEO, Amazon, CSEs, which are comparison shopping engines. We all should also should look at things like our media budgets and um, how much we're going to apportion to paid search versus affiliates versus Amazon. Um, we need to understand the value of live chat and driving sales. We need to understand the value of merchandising, which is basically um, where you position your product on the page. Put the products that you want to sell the most, the ones with the best margin, the ones that are the most popular, up high on your page. Don't hide them. Merchandise your soul correctly. And then use analytics to understand what are, um, what are the types of products that people buy, what are the what are the different things that um, pages that people go, the different channels that people use, the devices that people use, and the locations where people are where they buy my product. You know, when it comes to a uh, search, always think of um, think of questions and answers. Google asks questions what they want. Google asks the questions what they want. They ask them as questions. So you must know what the questions that people are asking, then position your product as the solution to their needs. When it comes to, once they've hit your site, and um, they land on your site, so make sure you promote your product in a visible way, use discount codes, use live chat, and um, anything to kind of just help the process along. And then understand that measuring everything in analytics across e-commerce is essential because you do need what's called a single source of truth. That is essentially, all of your traffic that goes to your website needs to be managed in one system, usually something like Google Analytics. And then you can match that up with what you're seeing in the e-commerce engine. You can also match that up with what you're seeing in Facebook, in Google, in Bing, in Yahoo, in Twitter, and Instagram, and all that stuff. Because they're all different platforms, but you, they all feed into one platform, which is Google Analytics. And that's your single source of truth. And that's where you can really evaluate the difference between um, between each of your products. So um, I did want to talk a little bit about that. And then understanding how to retain customers. So we can retain customers obviously by using email. We know their email address. Uh, we've emailed them uh, transaction completes. We've emailed them out their orders, all that stuff. So we can give them coupons once we have the right consent from them. We need to have consent from them for marketing emails. Um, so we can send them coupons, we can retarget them and bring them into things like our loyalty program. Because remember, it's much easier to sell to someone who's already bought from you. Um, as I said, make sure you do have GDPR and other legal compliance to re-engage past, um, past uh, uh, purchasers. Uh, reward customers with special discounts, early offers and ex of course exclusive content. And try to build a culture of getting customers to actively review your stuff, to become brand advocates, to do UGC of your, um, UGC is user generated content of unboxing and things like that. So a lot of things to think about and um, a lot of things to think about in a very short period, but, um, but certainly, you know, if this is the foundational elements of starting an e-commerce store, we can optimize these channels, we can develop these channels and better our understanding of all of the elements of e-commerce from this webinar itself and just develop it out, make it closer to your um, to your needs and, uh, and take it from there. So my kind of summary here is, we'll just go through the, the four elements there. So it is important to plan and understand the commercial opportunity of your business venture. You know, when it comes to setup, choose the right website provider uh, for our needs taking into cost and functionality into account. When it comes to operations, understand that e-commerce isn't simply putting up a website and selling. There are numerous logistical elements involved, like shipping, storing, and buying stock, um, as well as purchasing and all that kind of stuff, packaging. Um, then when it comes to marketing, understand that the function and the value of different marketing channels in the purchase journey, from building the brand to through, uh, product awareness and sales, um, all work together. So you might use your PR for your awareness and then your PPC for your sales and all that, but don't use PPC for awareness because, for example, 
how's anyone going to search for you if they don't know about you? And um, likewise, we need to show the products. We need to be more visual, creative. We need to get some social media, that kind of thing going. Um, each of all of these steps contribute to the overall purchase journey and work together uh, to grow an e-commerce business when, when it is applied and managed correctly. So I know it's a lot to take in. I know some of this is a little bit far out, probably from where you're thinking with starting an e-commerce organization. But, um, but yeah, that's, um, that's kind of the foundational understanding that anyone starting e-commerce should have in their back pocket before they dive into launching a venture. So that brings an end to our presentation. Um, hi, Caroline. Hi, Carl. Thanks for that now. Great. So with a rocky We've start. Sides. We have. We have swapped yeah. like me and Cahill were saying earlier. We, we do look like we're in the same house, given our pink background. But we we well, are in the social you know, Caroline, what I've learned from doing a lot of webinars recently is everyone has the exact same colour on the walls. Everyone in the world, everyone has white door frames and that kind of beige you put around the wall. That's it's just... like we, we were prepared for this. <laughs> we almost like knew. We prepared for a pandemic. Um, Carl, we have had so many questions and so um, I, I we're not going to get through them all, but I'll try and cover as much ground as possible and ask you a good diverse mix of questions here. Um, so we'll kick off with Amin, who is asking, is there any specific consumer journey for e-commerce that you'd recommend? Um, well, uh, the consumer journey is mean many things so the consumer journey is generally identify need or want and search for alternatives evaluate or search for options evaluate alternatives decide to purchase and then purchase that's what marketing 101 will tell you that the consumer journey is um so we just need to understand that that's how people decide to buy so what we need to do is be present at all of those points so when someone is when someone uh, realizes they have a need or a want, we need to be present on social media to show them our product and then guide them to the content that educates them to why we're the best solution to their needs. Then when they decide, yes, these guys are decent, I know a bit more about the market and the offering, they'll do a search. That's when we use SEO and PPC. And, um, and we bring them in there. When they decide to purchase, it's because we've been so compelling with our content and we've been so visible with our marketing that they decide, yeah, okay, these are the guys. When they go ahead and purchase, they'll probably type your brand name into Google and they'll just buy from you. And that's that's generally the journey. I know that there's different interpretations of the consumer journey, so that's one we can offer, but ultimately there's, there's loads of different interpretations of what that actually is, but I hope that answers partly the question anyway. Um. If we move on to Lorraine, because she's asking something that I think a lot of online businesses would relate to, which is the new model of subscription services. So yes. she is asking, what are the key considerations if you're trying to sell a subscription service online and not a physical product? So um, you're subscribing maybe to uh, technology or you're subscribing to services or something like that. I suppose if, if there's nothing physical, if there's nothing physical, that means that there are no product shots. If there's no product shots, that means that you need to develop content that tells people the value of the product. You need to show the benefits. So you need to show what someone will look like or feel like after they use your product um, or after they use your service. Or your, you, you, know, um, you need to show what's new, why it's valuable. So very much in the uh, subscription world, it is it's heavy content play because you don't have a physical product that you can show. You need to kind of show the, the value of, of subscribing because people aren't going to give you, the, give you their money unless they feel that, um, that there's something adequate in return. We need to be compelling with the content that we have on our website in order to, um, in order to uh, ensure that they do go ahead and subscribe. So it's very much a content play. The question you need to ask yourself is, why would someone do this? what's in it for them, yeah. you know, and then create the content that answers that need. And that's probably the easiest, or that's probably the, the starting point for, um, for any kind of subscription service, simply because you can't show a product. 
Um, Ashley is asking, do you have any tools that you'd recommend for doing a competitive analysis online um, and for social listening? Um, for social listening, I'd use Google Alerts because it's free. Uh, as I, I mentioned that in the webinar, so you just, you get an email every time there's a mention of your brand or your competitors or stuff like that. It's not very slick looking, but it certainly gives you, it's certainly free. Um, but, uh, but you can also use things like Twitter. Uh, so you can do hashtag searches on Twitter to find out what are people talking about your industry and you can just explore that. Um, a lot of competitive analysis without any paid tools, um, which uh, I find you're just using, you're just taking notes, you're using Excel, you're building, you're, you're building up um, information on your Google research or whatever like that. So it's, it's there's also a, a new tool um, that you might use. It's called SparkToro. It was created by um, the, uh, the, uh, the founder of Moz, uh, Rand Fishkin. He only launched about a month ago or something like that. But that will show you influencers and it'll show you audiences and stuff like that that are interested in certain groups. So that gives you a view of the audience to understand the competitive landscape. I think Spark Toro might allow you five free searches a month or something like that. So it's interesting. So it's only brand new. I literally, I haven't become so familiar with it myself. It's, it's about a week, like a month old or something like that. So, um, but that's an interesting one you might use. Okay, thanks, Carl. Um, we've Scott from Melbourne, Australia, who's asking, when you're doing research, would you use Amazon warehouses or systems um, to work out trends on whether people will buy? So, for example, would you recommend Zonda that Amazon use? Um, I haven't used either of those, so um, I'm in no position to answer that question. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay we can't use yeah, all no, of I, I actually i haven't <laughs> used i haven't used either of those um those tools so i'm I'm just not familiar with them um, um so yeah let's Sorry. move on sure and then we'll we'll go for ross rossa so bearing in mind the huge range of online material can you recommend two research resources to follow up with specifically to help in an e-commerce setup and trends please um, I'd say one of those is obviously the My DMI library. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so obviously the My DMI library is an excellent resource full of uh, full of wonderful e-commerce stuff. But also you can look at the e-consultancy blog, which is free. You can look at thinkwithgoogle.com. So that's thinkwithgoogle.com. You can do, if you want to just look at case studies um, and industry stuff, you can literally do LinkedIn, just Google LinkedIn case studies. Facebook case studies, Instagram case studies, Twitter case studies, and they will all have free resources for you to look at. So um, that's something that I'd look at. There's also, there's loads of e-commerce blogs out there. There's something like the Shopify blog, the Magento blog, you know, all of that stuff is useful as well. Um, but specific to industries, something like the consumer barometer um, or the industry's research area of Think with Google is a good place to look. Excellent, thanks, Carl. Um, Tanya is asking, is Shopify compatible with WordPress or only Woohoo, Woo, WooCommerce? I was putting in a who there um, as well. <laughs> so if you have a WordPress website, you should probably use WooCommerce rather than Shopify, I think. Well, it depends because you'll ultimately have two websites. Then you'll have a WordPress website and you'll have a Shopify website. And I can't see what you'd use them for. Like if you had a blog, you might put it on WordPress. And then if you started selling e-commerce, you might put it on Shopify. It's two websites. I would generally try and keep uh, Shopify to Shopify and uh, WordPress to WooCommerce. So, um, so I wouldn't mix them as a rule just because it adds a layer of complication for you to manage. You've now, you've now got two websites that you have to manage and that's tricky. Okay, thanks, Carl. Um, Svetlana, sorry, this is quite a wordy one, but quick question about Shopify and abandoned checkout recovery. I understand that this option emails individuals who had placed their email into a field and then abandoned their cart. Would you happen to know if this is available for only for registered accounts or for users without accounts too? 
The reason why I'm asking this is because of GDPR. If a person hasn't registered and agreed to share their data yet, is this all uh -huh. right? I have the answer for this. Um, there is a clause in GDPR called fulfillment of contract, uh, which basically means that I need certain information from you to, um, uh, in order to complete uh, our contract. So by sending someone out a, an email, um, these, are, these are what's called uh, transactional emails. You don't know the person. You don't know their details. You don't know anything about them um, as a human. Uh, the hum like I have no contact whatsoever with um with someone who abandons the checkout. I just press a button in Shopify and it does it. I never see the database. I never see anything about them. You know, um, so it means that I have, don't have access to what's called PII, which is personally identifiable information. So there is no contravention of uh, GDPR to um. To sending uh, cart abandonment emails or check out abandonment emails using things like Shopify simply because we don't see the PII. Sim as well as that, we do need the, we do need them to uh, to complete the purchase to fulfill the contract. And second of all, it's not marketing emails. GDPR generally focuses in on personally identifiable information and consent for marketing emails. This is a contractual fulfillment email and it is transactional email rather than marketing. So it, it manages to be GDPR compliant simply for that reason. However, if you were to take the details, dig into the, dig into the cart abandonment and take the details of that person and abandon and email them from your MailChimp or something, that would be in G contravention of GDPR because you've, you, you, the person, have taken details, put it in, you have been exposed to PII. Um, and you're using MailChimp, which is generally not a, is more a marketing platform, even though you can do abandonment emails with it, but you're better off just, you, you just press the button that says uh, send recovery email and you'll be fine. Thanks, Cahal. That answer was as comprehensive as the question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's legalese and it's, it's GDPR, which is, um, which is always a bit of a minefield, but no, it is okay. Absolutely. And we've got a good few questions coming in about the drop shipping. So if I summarize it down to um, which platform really works well best for drop shipping um, in terms of ease of ordering, etc. Um, either WordPress or Shopify are really good. So WordPress like WooCommerce or Shopify, just because they're just nice and easy um, to use. Anyone who's doing drop shipping is probably they probably have an idea of what they're doing to some degree. So you wouldn't use something really basic like Wix. You know, um, which you, because you're drop shipping, you're aware of margin, so you don't, you know, you might not use something like Squarespace unless you're selling high margin products. So I'd say Shopify or uh, WooCommerce are probably the two, two easiest to use for, for drop shipping simply because they're just handy. Perfect. Um, then we have Jody who is asking, you mentioned a Magneto required specific secure hosting. Do you know? Uh, what hosting options are available for other sites that you mentioned? So um, Magento has a has a specific hosting that is Magento hosting. It's it's like you you figure that out if you were ever to do that. You, if you're doing Magento, you you you'd end up knowing this. Um, Shopify comes with its own hosting. You don't have to buy hosting. It's part of the package, part of the twenty nine dollars. With WordPress, it um, you need to buy hosting, so it might come in at like seventy dollars a year or something from Black Knight or from HostGator or from you know just a normal website hosting organization that would host a WordPress site because WooCommerce is just WordPress plus e-commerce. Um, with Wix and Squarespace, hosting is included. Perfect, thanks, Carl. Um, we have Michelle who's asking. Um, if you initially set up your site using something like Spotify, how uh, Shopify, how easy is it at a later date to switch to um, Magneto? Nothing is easy. <laughs> um, it's it depends on a number of things, like the number of products you have, the different SKUs you have. Are you going to keep your SKUs, which is your uh, your your product numbers, the same across the two channels? I've done it. I've done a Magento to a Shopify migration, 
where I downloaded all of the products from Magento into a spreadsheet, then reformatted the spreadsheet for upload into Shopify. So if you're good at Excel, you can do it, where, and you can upload all the products. Where it'll take time is you just have to start uploading all the images and all of that stuff, and you'll probably have to do that manually because it'll be a certain suite of images per product. When you, when you upload your spreadsheet, it'll contain the SKU, the price, all the words, all the links, all that stuff, but, but, um, but it is, it's, it's heavy duty crossing, uh, doing any kind of uh, e-commerce website migration, I have to say it is, it, it's a lot of work. If you've got a lot of products, if you've like five products, you can find <laughs> But you probably won't be moving to Magento with five products anyway. But yeah, um, no, it, it, it's a good bit of work. Fantastic, thanks, Carl. Uh, Petja, uh, who's uh, tuning in from Germany, is asking, um, what's dropshipping? How can you implement um, packaging? Um, like, how, can you uh, personalize it in any way without ever seeing the products? With dropshipping, not really. You might have some arrangement with your wholesaler. You can come to a, an arrangement with your wholesaler, like that says, look. If I'm if I'm going to be buying off you, put please put it in this. But you're probably going to have to supply them with the packaging, the instructions, and pay them a fee in order for them to actually fulfil that. But yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it it can, can be done, you know, to some degree if um if you have the right relationship with your supplier, with your wholesaler. Um, thanks, Carl. We have a lot of questions coming in around about um recommending platforms for different sorts of businesses so if it's a hotel a restaurant food business even if it's a um consultancy recruitment um service anything along those um those lines so i suppose is do you need to look at different versions of platforms depending on the industry and sector that you're coming from yeah i think it boils down to um to are you a service or are you a product so if you're a product, any of the platforms that I mentioned are fine, depending on your needs. If you're a service, maybe Shopify isn't the best one. Maybe something like uh, WooCommerce would be better for, for SMEs, for smaller organizations. And um, SMEs might be, uh, and medium-sized organizations may be, may be suitable. And then Magento, obviously, for enterprise. But, um, but if you're a service, like you mentioned hotels and, and bars and stuff, Probably a WordPress site with a WooCommerce um, plugin is is all you need because you're trying to show the value of your service, the product, the, the imagery, writing in writing in um, that reasons to buy. Because remember when you asked that question around subscriptions, content is important. WordPress yeah. is better for content. Shopify is good for here's my product, here's the details. You know, um, so boils down to less so industry, but more are you a service or are you a product? Services will be, I would veer more towards the um, uh, the WordPress option for the majority of them. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Philip has emailed in, I'm a small informal business. Can I sell my products on social media platforms like Facebook Marketplace? And how effective are they as an e-commerce platform? Uh, I find really <laughs> ineffective um, to be honest um, I people do shop and they browse on Facebook marketplace and stuff like that but ultimately having a website and having a, like a, an actual domain that is your place that you control is just far more effective in resonating with people plus you have to be a Facebook user to buy on Facebook marketplace and if, that means you're automatically excluding people who don't use Facebook by, by setting up there. So everyone can use the World Wide Web, but only, you know, not everyone uses Facebook, not everyone uses Instagram. So there's, and I just find that Instagram shopping, Facebook shopping is good for browsing. It's good for when people are kind of considering a product, but when it comes to actually getting the credit card out, doesn't, doesn't really hit the mark most of the time. Okay. Um, Pat is asking, what is the best API for video chat embed in a website? And are there any free APIs? It depends on different different tools and what you're trying to do. So is it going to be bots that you're going to use? Um, there's there's load, like I mean, without without kind of going too far into chat, um, there's things like you can use uh, 
the one that that dude from Word Stream set up, uh, uh, what's it called, Chat Monkey or whatever. That one's pretty okay. Um, there's other things like there's you can integrate Facebook chat into your into your website. You can integrate um, loads of different plugins into your website. You can if you're dealing with a third party like a, a customer service organization, they might have a chat. So it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I'm always reluctant to recommend chat because it's it, it walks the line between. Um, between selling and customer service, and depending on what your objective is for it, there's different options. But um, but yeah, like I mean, you can you can integrate Facebook chat into your into your website if you want it, you know, and that's that's a thing you can do. So it depends on what the option. I know that doesn't give a clear answer, but um, maybe there isn't a clear answer essentially. Um, we've got a few questions around both, um, budgets and uh, percentages of revenue. Yeah, yeah. So. If I start with Jeff, who is asking a small business looking to build an e-commerce store and a decent platform, um, talking about 20 odd products, just what sort of budget estimated are we talking? For developing the entire suite, I suppose. Um, well, how long is a piece of string? Um, it depends. It depends. But you know, you'd definitely be spending a few thousand dollars, you know, um, minimum. So you'll have your design. You're still, like, I mean, obviously you can just sign up for Shopify with $29 and get the basic template and just run with that and try and customize it. But you will need photographs, you will need design, you will need uh, different things like that. It's, you know, you're probably not going to do it for like under, under $10,000, I imagine. I would, uh, maybe you can, I don't know. Um, depends on loads and loads of factors, but it's not, it's not going to be like 500 quid, mm -hmm. you know, or, or a thousand quid. It will be, there'll be a, there'll be an investment in there, I'd say. Um, Holly is asking, at what percentage of revenue should you be spending on marketing to successfully sell online? Well, it, it actually depends on your ROI. So, um, so everything kind of like you do need to spend money to make money, and um, you'll probably lose a bit of money at the start uh, because that's just generally what happens. Um, but that's just your initial investment. Um, so, I generally split my marketing budgets like this. I put my brand building and awareness stuff in around twenty or thirty percent of my marketing pot. And I put my sales channels like SEO, PPC, affiliates in at about 70 or 80 percent of my budget pot. So what you need to do, like everything with budgets, is start off small and then grow it out to where mm -hmm. you're comfortable. Where do you start seeing ROI? Start doing some numbers around them. Um, if I invest 100, 100 euros or 100 dollars, do I get a thousand dollars in revenue back? You know, is that a good ROI? when I factor in my margin and my operating costs and different things like that. So there's no clear principle on it, but when it comes to in setting percentage of revenue to, um, uh, to a marketing budget, but when it comes to uh, how you split your marketing budget, I would do 30% awareness, 80%, 70% uh, conversion sales uh, channels. That would be generally the way I do it. Perfect, thanks, Carl. Susan is asking just for a bit of clarification. Um, she's wondering, would your suggestion be to hold off on PPC until your brand is established and findable? Yeah, so yeah. at least, you know, um, like don't wait too long either. Like, I mean, what I do, what I mean by that is, um, you're better off doing the groundwork on social uh, building a community on social, building a bit of content, getting getting known out there, doing some social ads and all that stuff to raise the awareness, do some PR, all that stuff. Um, when you start noticing uh, more traffic coming in from organic search than was typically your normal level, might be a time to start investing um, small amounts into paid search into obviously your brand name in one set of campaigns and then obviously generic keywords in other sets of campaigns. And see, and you can just kind of play around and see, can you scale that up a little bit? But 
you know, there's still people looking for your product out there, even before your brand is established. It's just when you start ramping up investment, um, with PPC, I'd start off smaller because it is expensive. I like, I mean, if you were launching a brand, you might launch it for like two months or something like that, six weeks on social media before you did PPC. Um, or if you were doing PPC, you might start PPC at week three, but start it really low and then ramp it up on week six or something if the metrics give you that. But, um, but I would invest more in the awareness-based channels at, the, at, at launch. Perfect. Thanks, Carl. Now, I know we're running over, so I might just uh, ask uh, two questions just to close out this um, session today. So let's see. I'm trying to find something we haven't covered already. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah, so Michelle is asking, if you're selling a product throughout Europe, would you create a website locally to each country or would you use subdomains? Um, there's different things we can do. We can have language translators on our site. Uh, you have to remember throughout Europe, there's predominantly about like, I don't know, about nine currencies, nine main currencies outside of like the Euro itself. The majority of people use, use it. There's um, there's delivery and logistics agreements between the European states and the European Economic Area, so you don't have to worry about that stuff. Um, unless you really want to, um, unless you really want a, a different experience for um, every single country, uh, you can essentially just translate your website and dynamically translate your website uh, to the to the different markets. I. I generally don't use subdomains uh, when it comes to the technical side of things. If you were to decide to go ahead and do it, I use subdirectories. So a subdomain is Ireland.coholshop.com or Switzerland.coholshop.com. I would do coholshop.com forward slash Switzerland or forward slash because for SEO purposes, uh, subdomains are treated as separate websites, whereas sub so so um you'll be diluting your SEO by having them on subdomains, have them on subdirectories. If it's good enough for Apple, you know, it's good enough for me. Apple do apple.com forward slash IE forward slash UK because they understand the value of having one website with different, with different kind of uh, subdirectories that all feed into one SEO area. So um, I would not do subdomains if it were to come to it. And if I could even avoid that, I'd just translate the site. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, we'll finish off with one that really goes to the the um, topic of this webinar from Craig from Scotland. So um, is ask he's just starting out. So he's asking your thoughts on whenever you're building a new business, should you use an established e-commerce platform, say like eBay at first, and then when would you look and think it's worthwhile um, to start investing and in setting up your own site then? Mm. Okay, so eBay and Amazon are kind of like their marketplaces where you can sell your product using their infrastructure, access to their audience. There's no harm in starting off there, but you know, um, it, it shouldn't be a determining factor as to whether you're going to build a website. You should always try and build a website. If you're selling stuff, you should always try and build a website. Um, but it's not a it's not a bar bad place to start but it, it just wouldn't be a determining factor i wouldn't say like oh look i'm, I'm not going to do it uh, i have this you know i would always try and go ahead and build a website because remember you're only selling to ebay audience you're only selling to amazon audience what about the rest of the world wide web so that's where having your own website comes in but yeah. it's not a it's not a bad starting place would be would be the, the long and short of it perfect thanks Cahal. um and thank you all for attending today's uh, webinar. It's been great. The feedback, Cahal, by the way, coming in is fantastic. So thanks very much for all your comprehensive uh, both presentation and the Q&A session as well. 
we have had a full capacity webinar with people joining us from around the globe. I hope you are all keeping safe and well um, during these times. Um, just to let you know that uh, all the attendees today will be getting a copy of this recording and it will be emailed out to you now that this webinar is concluding within the next hour. Um, those attending will also be getting a certificate of attendance and our CPD members will be having the credits off automatically added to their CPD records with us. Um, the presentation and the webinar will be hosted and live on our My DMI library. So if anybody wants to tune in and get a recap of Cahal's presentation and the accompanying slides, you'll be able to do that probably within the next 36 hours or so. We'll, we'll edit this uh, recording so that we have a nice clean version to live up there um that's topped and tailed um but other than that without um anything else uh just thank you so much for attending and for all your contributions and great questions today and thank you to you Cahal. it's a pleasure as always great stuff thanks caroline and um, yeah uh thanks to everyone for joining and hope to see you soon